Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, March the tw- March the twentieth. <laughs> okay, take two. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, everyone. It is Wednesday, March the tenth, twenty twenty one. See what I did there? I was going to say March the tenth, but I had already jumped ahead to twenty twenty one. So March the twin. March the 10th, 2021. It is currently 9.37 a.m. Central Time. And once again, I'm here at Victory Baptist Church inside the sanctuary, sitting in front of the microphone, ready to talk to you about something that it seems everyone is talking about. It seems it's uh, if you if you just go to Google and type in Christian news and go to any Christian news website right now, this is the story Everyone's talking about it. Everyone has an opinion. And to be honest with you, it just kind of shows something that's been true for it seems like about maybe two or three years, maybe even four years. I don't even know how far back because I've always kind of been fascinated by it. But anytime Beth Moore says anything, anytime anyone talks about Beth Moore, it becomes a big story. Beth Moore has become kind of this lightning rod. You just mention her name and it's either all of this hate and, oh, I can't stand her, or all of this love and all of this praise. Such a, there's such a clear divide when it comes to anything in regards to Beth Moore. She's she's such a subject of controversy. And to be honest with you, that, that very thing, the fact that she's the subject of so much controversy is the thing I am still trying to wrap my mind around. But we're going to look at this new story, and I'm, as I typically try to do, I'm going to try to approach it maybe from a little different perspective, and uh, it probably is not going to make me very popular, but uh, that's okay. That's okay. I'm going to try to look at this, and uh, because, uh, look, if I just if I just turn on this microphone and say what everyone else is saying, then what's the point of listening to me, right? If I'm just going to say what everybody else is saying, if I'm going to say what you expect me to say, then at some point I stop being, well, very useful. Now, for the long-time listeners, long-time listeners, you probably already know what I'm going to say. You, I, that would be interesting. We, we have some people who have been listening to me for years. I think that there's a lot of times they know exactly what I'm going to say. I hope, I hope there's still enough uncertainty. <laughs> I hope there's still enough uncertainty. They're like, you know, I'm never quite sure what you're going to say. I hope that's always the case. I hope to some level, um, because um, I always try to take what, you know, Whenever I deal with something that's that's going on within culture, or within Christianity, I always try to take some time to go, okay, what can I add to the, to the conversation? Everyone else is saying the same thing. This will happen whenever there's a big news story, and I'll get in the car. Let's say I'm listening to talk radio. Um, it doesn't matter if it was Glenn, uh, Glenn Beck, obviously still alive, or if it was Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, it does, you just name any, any, anyone. And sometimes you could sit there and listen from, you know, just go from program to program to program. By the time you get to the evening, you have to stop and ask yourself, okay, did anyone really offer anything different or did they all just kind of say the same thing all day long? You know, eight, nine hours listening to talk radio. They all basically covered this issue basically the same way. They didn't, no one really added anything really unique to it. They, they, they spoke about it in their own unique style, using humor or whatever. But when you get down to it, they didn't really say anything different. And sometimes you're like, okay, that's, you would hope someone could offer something different or unique or advance the conversation. So that's what I try to do. Do I always succeed? Obviously, I do not. Obviously, I, I, I fall short plenty of times, but that's what I strive to do. I try to pay attention to what people are saying and go, okay, right, no one's looking at it from this perspective. So that's what I'm going to try to do here. Hopefully, it will be beneficial. But before we get to the Beth Moore news, let me kind of give you my history with Beth Moore, right? Right. Um, because this is where this is where the story gets just kind of confusing from my perspective. I don't even know the first time I heard about Beth Moore. It had to be. I I would have to look at how long she's been in ministry, how long she, her books and things have been sold. I would have to go back and look. But it feels like put it this way: whether it was Beth Moore specifically going all the way back into the 1990s there were i i spoke against something that was becoming very common 
in churches, and I did not understand it. And I, to this day, I still do not understand it. It would require women to explain it to me, but I've never yet had a woman explain it to me in any meaningful way that makes any sense. It really, whenever they try to explain it to me, I'm just kind of looking at them going, okay, you're still not really explaining it. You're just kind of talking in circles. So maybe to the women who are listening, you can you can help me understand because, because I'm telling you as from my perspective, and it may be just because I'm a guy, maybe I don't get it, but I just don't get it. And if you can help me get it, then by all means, help me get it. All right. But here's the thing that I started seeing developing in the 1990s. Anytime the women and a church wanted to have quote unquote, and I put it in quotes, a Bible study. Hey, the ladies are going to get together and do a Bible study. It seems like that, that what they immediately had to do was they would go on, you know, CBD, uh, Christian book distributors, or they would go to the local Christian bookstore and they would get a woman's Bible study. A woman, because if the women are going to get, get together, they need a woman's Bible study written by a woman, right? K. Arthur, um, Beth Moore, I can't think of any, some of the other, uh, with Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, if I can get her name out correctly. Oh, is it something DeMoss? I think, I don't remember her first name, but there was, there was a, a number of women who just, that, that's what you would hear. Uh, you know, the women are going to get together or, and, and sometimes it wasn't like anything organized by the church. Just the women would get to want to get together to do a Bible study, to do the Bible study. And it always felt like that they had to have they had to go buy a Bible study. They had to buy a Bible study, which I never, right there, I was already confused. I'm like, no, ladies, you learn how to study the Bible. Some of whichever woman in the group feels that she can teach the women correctly. She takes the Bible study guide and develops an actual Bible study. She writes it out, right? We're going to study the book of Philippians. Well, you get the women together, maybe teach them the chapter summary method. Then all the women do the chapter summary method and then meet to discuss their chapter summary method. They do. You, you like actually do Bible study, but that's, it never worked that way. It's like, no, we're all going to go get a book by Beth Moore, K. Arthur, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, whomever. Like I said, I've already named some of the names. And then we, I guess they're supposed to read it and then they get together to discuss it. I, I just, I to this day, I don't understand that. And why does it have to be a Bible study written by a woman? Since when does Bible study become gender specific, right? Hey, women, when you do a woman's Bible study, it's got to be written by a woman. And when the men get together to do the men's Bible study, it's got to be a, a Bible study written by a man. I, I, I don't, like when I do my Bible study exercises, I don't perceive them having any gender attached to it. It's a Bible study exercise. Men and women can participate. So I never understood why did it have to be a woman's, why, why can some woman explain that to me? Now I understand that there are some issues that women face that a woman can speak to far better than a man, right? There are issues I think that men deal with that sometimes a man can understand better than a woman. But if it's Bible study, now if it's a, we're going to study this topic, we're going to, we're going to deal with this topical issue. And we believe this woman can speak to this issue better for women or this man can speak to this issue. Okay, I understand. But then refer, then don't refer to it as a Bible study. Refer to it that you're getting together to discuss a topic, right? But Bible study, I don't see why it has to be, you know, you go into the Christian bookstore with the Christian industrial complex, and here's the women's Bible study section, and here's the men's, like, I don't, it's just Bible study. Why is it so gender specific? And then you have women's conferences, and you have men's conferences, I think personally, and you can you can you can dis, disregard what I'm about to say. I think it's all just a part of the Christian industrial complex. You need product to sell, and you, and how do you do? You develop products for specific demographics. So hey, we got to have youth Bible studies. We got to have women's Bible study. We got to have senior adults Bible study. We got to break everyone into demographics. They're marketing demographics, and then we got to produce product to sell to that specific demographic, and then we can make money, 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 money. It's to me, it's more about that, and Christians just fall into it because we are influenced by marketing. Or influenced by these techniques that are used by companies to sell things. So develop Bible studies. And so the woman, like, hey, if, you, if you're a woman and you're going get to get together to do a woman's Bible study, you need something written by a woman to teach you the Bible. And I'm like, I, why? I, 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 to this day, I still don't understand that. 
If you're, if you're talking about a specific topic that a woman can speak specifically to, okay. But Bible study, someone take a Bible, open it up, and develop the study that you're going to do. Use a Bible study method. There's so many ways you can actually engage in meaningful Bible study, not not the, look, are you studying the Bible? Or are you studying what Beth Moore says about the Bible? Are you studying the Bible? Or are you studying what Kay Arthur says about the Bible? And they say, well, these Bible study guides actually get you into scripture. Are you sure? Are you sure? So I, I, I never understood it. And all the way back then, I know it was somewhere in the 1990s, had to be in the 1990s. I know by the time we get to the 2000s, I know I was specifically mentioning Beth Moore by name. There was lots of issues with some of her theological perspectives and theological teachings. And I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, what? no, but it didn't matter. No, you, if you were warning about Beth Moore, if you were warning about the whole, what I will call the, the women's Bible study, you know, product line, if you spoke against it, everyone looked at you like you were crazy. And if you spoke against Beth Moore, people like you're being judgmental, you're being bigoted, hateful, you know, arrogant. You think you, you your theology is better than her theology. And it's like, it, it became like, there's no point in trying to fight against it. Doesn't, it was like, there's no point in trying to fight against it because, because you're just, you just hate women. And it's like, I had nothing to do about hating women. I just didn't understand the way it worked. All right. So I offered criticism Again, going back into the 1990s, all the way into the 2000s, I offered criticisms uh, about a lot of this stuff. And I was I felt like I was in very much in the minority, very much in the minority, and people didn't listen. I had women in my own church who didn't who didn't really listen or or consider my thoughts uh, about this as being really that relevant. And none of them really ever could give me a good answer either. But okay, fine. If y'all want to get together and study Beth Moore, okay. You know, I think there's things far more theologically sound than that, but okay, all right, whatever. You know, you know how about instead of getting together studying Beth Moore, you get together and study, I don't know, the Puritan Catechism, Westminster, larger and smaller catechism, Luther's catechism. I don't know the creeds, uh, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith. I could give you a lot of things that are far more theologically beneficial than that, but no, it had to be a woman's Bible, Bible study. I still don't get it. I still don't. It, it was almost like, It was almost like, uh, you know, like uh, candy to a kid, right? It's like, oh, we've got it. We, I don't. Was it something about the way the books were written? Is it something? I don't know what it was, but it's like they they had to have them. And if you if you walk into sometimes uh, here in in the local area, the Denny's uh, restaurant, you'll go in there, and sometimes you'll see a group of women together, and they'll have their little Bible study books. Or you go into a coffee shop, there'll be the women all in a circle with their little Bible study books from some, and usually it's a woman. And I will always look or I'll, or if I walk by, I may ask, oh, what are y'all studying? Because I just, I'm always curious. And it's like, you know, here's women. <laughs> and it's like, why is it, why, who wrote that law? Hey, women can only study the Bible in a group with a book written by a woman. Who, who created that idea? Where did it come from? I, I don't get it. But I criticized it, criticized it, criticized it, and nobody listened. And then the next thing you know, it it really felt like, now, and I know this is probably not an accurate description, but it felt like overnight, Beth Moore went from like superstar that very few people criticized. There was criticisms, but not a lot. Her 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 materials were used in any kind of church, from Baptist churches, you name it. All kinds of churches. It didn't matter their theological background. Charismatic, liberal, conservative. It, it didn't matter. Beth Moore books were being used by the women in those churches, whether the pastors wanted to admit it or not. And nobody really said much about it. It was just kind of like, okay, the women are going to go do that. Or what? I think some some male pastors, it's not worth fighting. Just let the women go do it and just move on. I got a, I got a bigger battles to fight than them using a Beth Moore book. So she just kind of became... I don't want to say the flavor, and not just the flavor of the month, the flavor of a, of, of a few, maybe a decade. She was just there. You just, women in the church knew who Beth Moore were, and they probably used one of her studies, and everybody loved it. And, that, and that's the way it went. And then all of a sudden, it, it felt like overnight, Beth Moore went from everyone seemed to love her, and very few people criticized her, and, and, they, and even those who criticized her just kind of gave up, to Beth Moore, go home. Go home. I just saw a Christian ministry just tell Beth Moore in a post to go home and shut the 
And I cannot repeat, the, the, a very warm place, we refer to it as hell, they just told her to shut the, and they literally posted this, and I'm like, whoa. So now it go, it, it, it's turned to that extreme, and of course the whole famous John MacArthur telling, you know, she should go home. Um, all, you know, all, all of these, and it's just, what happened? Like, how did Beth Moore become this lightning rod of such controversy? She, she seemed just to kind of be accepted and nobody much cared. There was some criticism, but not too much. Even in my independent fundamental Baptist church, my pastor had, was very strong against some of this, but even the women in, in some of those independent fundamental Baptist churches, they would still use Beth Moore books, K. Arthur, you name, and I still didn't get it. It's like, it's like the women just would not listen. I have to have that woman's uh, Bible study guides. It, I still don't. I still don't understand it. So, what happened? What What was the the tipping point? Did Beth Moore become more theologically liberal? Did she become more apostate in her theology? I think we could go all the way back, and there were theological issues. But but okay, okay. So so did she just have a? Did she jump the shark theologically? or listen to it, wait for it. Did she jump the shark using that? And if you don't know that phrase comes from back in, back in the day, there was a, a, a television sitcom called Happy Days. And in that show, there was a, a character by the name of the Fonz, right? And he was like one of the main characters. And he, he was in this situation where he had to jump a shark tank like on jet on, on skis, jump a shark tank, and he wore a leather jacket to do it. it, it it's over the top ridiculous. And they said that's where the show jumped the shark. And so now it's used to describe when a television show has jumped the shark that it it's no longer any good. It's now turned bad. It's no good. So did Beth Moore, in a sense, jump the shark and just, you know, just became unacceptable? What happened? Is it because of her theology? Wait, oh, now listen carefully. Or did she jump the chart the shark politically? She came out and said things that went against the predominant view in a good portion of white evangelical world that not only should you vote for Donald Trump, you must vote for Donald Trump, you must support Donald Trump. And if you do not vote and support Donald Trump, and if you dare criticize if you do, if you don't support, if you do not vote, and if you criticize Donald Trump, then most likely you're not even a Christian. That's really the the atmosphere. That's the climate that started arising within Christianity. So, did Beth Moore commit some theological crime, or did she commit a political crime? And the minute she committed a political crime, then everyone turned on her. And when I say everyone, not everyone, a large portion of the church turned on her. Did it have anything to do with her theology? anything to do with her preaching or teaching, and it ha- did it have everything to do with her politics? I'm going to argue that this is more of a political issue than it is a theological issue. However, once you turn on someone, once you turn on someone within Christianity, then you go back, you kind of go out to the, your shed and open up the toolbox and you pull out some the- theological issues so that you can go back and beat the person to death. I know that's a very vivid way of describing it, but I think sometimes theology simply becomes that tool that we use, that hammer, so that we can pound someone over the head once we don't like them. Now, while we, before when we liked them, we were able to kind of, you know, look the other way, maybe theologically. But once we are, we, once we are against them, now theology matters. Now, now she needs to be quiet. Now, and then, and then everyone claims, you know, then all of a sudden, like, no, I, I was always against her. Really, you were always against her. When, when was where, where, where did you speak? Where can you show me? Um, and I, and I think that that this is really a political issue. I could be wrong. But that's the way I feel. Let, let's read some of the reports and, and I'll show you kind of where it shows up. All right. Here we go. This comes from the Religion News Service. It was published. Do I have a date here? It was published March the 9th, 2021. All right. Here we go. Bible teacher Beth Moore splitting with Lifeway says I'm no longer a Southern Baptist. Now, Lifeway is a big publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, we use some of their um, I think about every quarter, I usually get the guide for people if they if they want to use it in our church. Well, 
I think I just get it mainly for me and one other person. Um, but I just, I use it as kind of like a starting to start my own Bible studies. Um, I usually do my own studies. I just kind of look at where they cover it. But so, yeah, uh, we've used Lifeway material here at different times, all right? But it says she's splitting with Lifeway and she's no longer a Southern Baptist. The famed Bible study teacher says she no longer feels at home in the denomination that once saved her life. Now, I don't know if that's the religion news service saying that. I don't know why. I don't know if Beth Moore, I don't have it in quotations. Did she say the denomination saved her life or did she say God saved her life? I, I, I don't know exactly, but okay. So then I have a picture of Beth Moore. Um, it says here, this was uh, author and speaker Beth Moore speaking during a panel on sexual abuse and the Southern Baptist Convention. All right. Now, please note, this was in 2019, speaking about sexual, sexual abuse in the church. Stop right there. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to be very careful how I say this. It, it seems that when women come out and talk about sexual abuse in the church, that do they begin then become controversial? Um, are they then controversial if a woman speaks up and says the way the church presents different teachings about sexuality, this is how they make women feel, this is, and do the immediately the woman, is, is she now viewed as a problem? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying, you've got to kind of, you've got to just see it from my perspective. Beth Moore was pretty much, even though some people weren't fans of her, she was so widely accepted and nobody really raised too many questions. And then all of a sudden she went from that to this controversial figure that somehow was like now bad. And I just think that sometimes you go back and look at what happened. I, I just, I think there were other issues at play. That's all I'm saying. I think there were other issues at play, but let's continue with the story. All right. I just think it's interesting that that's the, the picture they have for her speaking on, on a panel on sexual abuse. I just think it's interesting that that's the one they have. All right. So here we go. For nearly three decades, Beth Moore has been the very model of a modern Southern Baptist. She loves Jesus and the Bible and has dedicated her life to teaching others why they need both of them and their lives. Millions of evangelical Christian women have read her Bible studies and flocked to her to uh, flock to hear her speak at stadium style events where Moore delves deeply into biblical passages. Now stop right there. That is accurate. For years, or, or as, as they stated, for nearly three decades, for three decades, millions, millions of evangelical Christian women read her Bible studies and flocked to hear her speak at these conferences. Stadiums packed out. And there was very little criticism of it. Now, there was some, I'm not denying that there were some. I'm just saying for the most part, everyone would just kind of look the other way. What changed? That's the point of this story that I'm going to drive. What changed? What made the dramatic, like, no, now Beth Moore is of the devil. Yeah, was it the theology or, or something else? Let's continue. Uh, Moore's uh, outsized Okay, and this is the way it's written here. Let me make sure I'm on the right paragraph. Moore's outsized influence and role in teaching the Bible have always made some evangelical power brokers uneasy because of their belief only men should be allowed to preach. Okay, there has been some concern with that, no question about it. Uh, but Moore was above reproach, supporting Southern Baptist teaching that limits the office of a pastor to men alone and cheerleading for the missions and evangel evangel evangelistic work that the denomination holds dear, right? Uh, she has been a stalwart for the word of God, never compromising. Former Lifeway Christian Resource, uh, Resources President Tom Rayner said in 2015 during a celebration at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center in Nashville that honored 20 years of partnership between the Southern Baptist Publishing House and more. Now, please note, 2015, 2015, she's still being praised as a stalwart for the word of God, never compromising. Right, she was being celebrated in 2015. All right, just keep that in mind. Um, it says here, and when and when uh, and when all is said and done, the impact of Beth Moore can only be measured in eternity's grasp. 
All right. So that, I mean, that's, that's some big praise that when it's all said and done, Beth Moore, Beth Moore can only be measured in eternity's grasp. Only eternity will be able to uh, uh, us to understand the influence of Beth Moore and all that she did. I mean, again, millions of evangelical women at some point in their life probably have been a part of some woman's Bible study group that pulled out Beth Moore material. I, I, I'm, I'm probably, it's almost, it's probably more common than even I understand it. But then what happened? What changed? What changed? It's a name. Donald Trump. Then came along Donald Trump. And I will say everything changed. Everything changed dramatically. And that's the part of the story that cannot be overlooked. Everybody can, I know a lot of people are like, who, good riddance, get rid of Beth Moore. Who cares? Didn't like her anyway. She's garbage. You know, she's, and, and now you hear, she's, you know, Black Lives Matter, liberal, critical race theory, you know, all, get rid of her. And just, and, 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 and everyone just turned on. What, what changed? I'm going to say Donald Trump is what changed. Here we go. Moore's criticism, Beth Moore's criticism of the 45th president's abusive behavior towards women and her advocacy for sexual abuse victims turned her from a beloved icon to a pariah in the denomination she loved all her life. Did you hear that? Remember I said that that they, they put that p- picture of her speaking at a sexual abuse situation. I, I think that that's where thing. I think that's where things started to change, right? She, she he she spoke out against the president's abusive behavior towards women, and her advocacy for sexual abuse victims turned her from a beloved icon to a pariah in the den- denomination she loved all her life. Why would that get you in trouble? You criticize some of the things the president, his attitudes and actions towards women, and you speak out for sexual abuse victims, and that makes you a pariah. Everyone turns on you. No, no, no one will say that they, no, they'll be saying, no, 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 no. That's not why we turned on her. That's not why we turned on her. Yeah, because you can convince yourself you turned on her for theological issues, but weren't those theological issues present for a very long time? Isn't it just interesting that now those theological issues bothered you, but they didn't bother you before? What really bothered you? Oh, you don't like what she had to say about President Trump. That's what bothered you. Can't everyone see how disingenuous this, I think this is on its surface. Um, Let's continue. Um, uh, The article continues this way. uh, Wake up sleepers to what women have dealt with and all with all along in an environment of gross entitlement and power. Moore once wrote about Trump um, on a passage from the New Testament book of Ephesians, all right? So, wake up sleepers to what women have dealt with all along in an environment of gross entitlement and power. So, she she was telling people, you need to wake up to what women have been dealing with in an environment of gross entitlement and power. You see how that's going to make some people mad or like, wait, what are you doing? How dare you bring this up and that the church has ever been an issue like this? And again, she was dealing with uh, some things about Trump and that how Trump has what that his actions and attitudes are what women have had to deal with all along in an environment of environments of gross entitlement and power. Because of her opposition to Trump and her outspokenness in confronting sexism and nationalism in the evangelical world, more has been labeled. Are you ready? a liberal, woke, and even a heretic for daring to give a message during a Sunday morning church service. Now, all of us, now please note those titles, uh, liberal and woke, liberal and woke. This is the language that's coming to the church now. It's not theological classifications, it's political classifications. You're liberal, you're woke, that's it, we're done with you, we're finished. We don't want you talking about Christian nationalism. We don't want you talking about Donald Trump. We don't want you talking, no, we don't want to hear any of that. We don't want to hear any of that because the church has become so politically hijacked. And if you don't go along with that political narrative, then you're woke, you're liberal, and you're a heretic. Now, she gave a message during a Sunday morning church service. Now, I... 
we, we could we could talk all day about whether that right and wrong. You can have your different opinions. I obviously believe that the pulpit is obviously from a biblical perspective for a man, not for a woman. But guess what? Uh, the, many of those churches had no problem with Beth Moore preaching it all, uh, all all over the place and all kinds of conferences. Now you could argue that wasn't inside the church. You you, you could have. You you could talk about that all day. We could have that discussion. But I think that became secondary. I think whether she was preaching in front of men or not preaching in front of men, preaching behind a pulpit, not preaching behind a pulpit, preaching inside a church, not inside a church, I think that was secondary. That became ammunition. That became the theological hammer that they could use to go after her. But they were more bothered by the things she was saying about Trump, Christian nationalism, and things she was saying about sexism uh, within the church. That is where I think people turned on her. And I think to deny that just is not, is not accurate. It, it's not accurate. Finally, Moore had had enough. She told Religion News Service in an interview Friday, March the 5th, that she is no longer a Southern Baptist. I'm still a Baptist, but I can no longer identify with Southern Baptist, Moore said in the phone interview. I love so many Southern Baptist people, so many Southern Baptist churches, but I don't identify with some of the things uh, in our heritage that haven't that haven't remained in the past. Moore told the religion a news service that she recently ended her longtime publishing partnership with Nashville-based Lifeway Christian. While Lifeway will still distribute her books, it will no longer publish them or administer her live events. Um, full di- full disclosure: the author of this article is a former Lifeway employee. I'm glad that they uh, did that. Um, And then here's another picture of her addressing attendees at a summit on sexual abuse and misconduct in December of 2018. Do you see a pattern here? She started speaking out about sexual abuse. She started speaking out about the attitudes and actions towards women of Donald Trump and saying these things, these things are wrong. These things are not accurate. And then all of a sudden, everyone's opinion of of Beth Moore started changing. Now, now they, they had theological issues to go after. They did. And they started pulling out those theological issues. I'm going to argue many of those theological issues were already present, but you didn't say a word when your women were studying her books, right? So, so, all right, here we go. Um, You see here, uh, then underneath that picture, they have this. Uh, Kate uh, Bowler, a historian at Duke Divinity School who has studied evangelical women celebrities, said Moore's departure is a significant loss for the Southern Baptist Convention. Moore, said, uh, Moore, she said, is one of the denomination's few standalone women leaders whose platform was based on her own charisma, leadership, and incredible work ethic and not her marriage to a famed pastor. Moore, Moore's husband is a plumber by trade. She also appealed to a wide audience outside her denomination. You know, she, she appealed to Christian women everywhere of all kinds of denominations, of all kinds of backgrounds. That's, that's why I think it's so interesting that there was such a change against her. Miss Moore is a deeply trusted voice across the liberal conservative divide and has always been able to communicate a deep faithfulness to her tradition without having to follow the Southern Baptist scramble to make Trump spiritually respectable, right? And that's that's what happened. A lot of Christians tried to make Trump spiritually uh, respectable, and she wouldn't have any of it. And a lot of us wouldn't have any of it. But if you did, then you became woke and liberal, and all of a sudden now you are a heretic. Um, The Southern Baptists have lost a powerful champion in a time in which their public witness has already been significantly weakened. Moore may be one of the most unlikely celebrity Bible teachers in recent memory. In the 1980s, she began sharing devotionals during the aerobics class she taught at First Baptist Church in Houston. Now stop right there. When your church is holding an aerobics class, there's a problem. See, see, it started off wrong. You're, you're teaching a devotional during an aerobics class being held at your church? Did anyone not realize? Why is a church holding an aerobics class? We need Christian aerobics? You have to go to Christian aerobics. You can't go to a non-Christian aerobics class. We need Christian aerobics. I guess a Christian gas station with Christian food. I mean, we, I mean, you know, we got to go to the Christian bookstore to get a book we, and to get music. We got to go to Chick Fil A to get a Christian chicken sandwich. I mean, and we got to go to a, we got to go to church to do aerobics. It just seems ridiculous. I've seen churches try to do Christian martial arts taught at a Christian church. What? what where is the church ever? 
call to hold aerobics classes and martial arts classes. I've seen this nonsense. It's ridiculous. And well, so, so already things start off problematic for me, but in the 1980s, all right? She then began teaching a popular women's Bible study at the church, which eventually attracted thousands of people each week. In the early 1990s, she wrote a Bible study manuscript and sent it to Lifeway, then known as the Baptist Sunday School Board, where it was rejected. However, after a Lifeway staffer saw Moore teach a class in person, the publisher changed its mind. Moore's first study, A Woman's Heart, God's Dwelling Place, was publicized in 1995 and was a hit, leading to dozens of additional studies, all backed up by hundreds of hours of research and reflecting Moore's relentless desire to know more about the Bible. So it was in the 1990s when I obviously started having issues. It it was before that with Probably though it was early 1990s when I started having a lot of the issue with women Bible studies, but Beth Moore started coming on the radar some time after 1995. So I want to make sure I get the chronology correctly. All right, from from 2001 to 2016, Moore's Living Proof uh, Ministries ran six figure surpluses, building its assets from about a million dollars in 2001 to just under. $15 million by April 2016, according to reports filed with the Internal Revenue Service. Her work as a Bible teacher has permeated down to small church Bible study groups and sold out stadiums with her living proof live events. Again, there's that big money, that big money. Bring in that money because now she had a product to sell. She became the product to be sold. And money was pouring at $15 million. How can a ministry be worth that much money? Again, we have have to ask the question, how much is too much? When is it right? When is it wrong? For more, the Southern Baptist Convention was her family, her tribe, her heritage. Her Baptist church where she grew up in Arkansas was a refuge from a troubled home where she experienced sexual abuse. Now see, she experienced sexual abuse. So she would obviously have something to say in regards to that subject, and she needed to be heard on that subject. Any woman speaking in regards to sexual abuse needs to be heard because, again, a a man may not be able to understand that perspective. And you may see why she had maybe some problems with Donald Trump. You you, you can probably kind of understand that now. But no, we just need to tell her to shut up and go home, right? Is that the Christian? Hey, we don't like Just shut up and go home. Now, yeah, there are some issues with her theology that I criticize and criticize the way her Bible studies were being used by women in the church. So I've been critical of it. But when it comes to something like that, I think we got to be very careful and maybe try to understand why she had some strong feelings. Um, She said, my local church growing up saved my life. So many times my home was an unsafe place. My church was my safe place. And all churches hopefully would be safe places. Hopefully. We should strive to make them safe places. As, and when I say a safe place, please don't, I'm not saying that we don't preach things that won't convict. I'm saying that obviously people should be safe to come there without having to worry about sexual abuse. All right. Um, as an adult, she taught Sunday school and Bible study. And then with her Lifeway partnership, her life became deeply inter- in- entwined with the denomination. She believed in Jesus and she also believed in the Southern Baptist Convention. All right. Um, in October 2016, more had what she called the shock of my life when reading the transcripts of the Access Hollywood tapes where Trump boasted of his sexual exploits with women. This wasn't just immorality, she said. This smacked of sexual assault. And let me make it very clear. I've heard plenty of men, Christian men, excuse what Donald Trump said on those tapes. That's just locker room talk. That's... But whenever women hear it, and I can't speak for all Christian women, but I know the, the women I, I've spoke to, I'll, I'll just, to my daughters, when they heard that tape, they were like, the man is bragging about sexual assault. That is disgusting and that is wrong. And any Christian man who tried to justify that and back that up should repent today for doing that because you were wrong and you were ungodly because those words that Trump was heard on that tape saying, that struck a chord with a lot of women, a lot of women who've had to deal with men grabbing and doing things to them without their consent and having to deal with men who treat women like, you know, a, a, 
I, I can't, I, I've got to be vivid, like a piece of meat. Something they want to devour for their own pleasure. And a lot of Christian men, and this is where Christianity really messed up. They tried to justify that, excuse that, explain that away. Overlook it. All of, all of a sudden, character didn't matter. Policy matter. Character. Now, when, when Clinton did something in the White House, oh, oh, no, character matters. But now, we, you know, Trump was the, the Republican Christian savior. We'll overlook it. Well, women didn't want to overlook that. And, and instead of we, many Christian men and, and, and many, many of the men in, as pastors would not listen to the women's concerns about such horrible words. Obviously, it's going to bother her, right? So she, as she says, this wasn't just immorality. This smacked of sexual assault. She expected her fellow evangelicals, especially Southern Baptist leaders she trusted, to be outraged, especially given how they reacted to Bill Clinton's conduct in the 1990s. And set, instead, they rallied around Trump. The disorientation of this was staggering, she said, just staggering. It was. It was staggering to anyone watching it, to any Christian going, I was in it. What? We what? We what? what? Like Christians are supporting this? And then you say like 82% of Christians. And like, what? why? Because it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Our, what we wanted, we wanted political power and we wanted political policy. We were more worried about politics than we were morality. We were, we were more, more worried about political power and influence than we were about righteousness. Moore, who described herself as pro-life from conception to grave, said she had no illusions about why evangelicals supported uh, Trump, who promised to deliver anti-abortion judges up and down the judicial system. So let me read this again. She, uh, Moore, Beth Moore, describes herself as pro-life. It says described herself as pro-life. I don't know if that's referring to she's changed. I don't, I don't think she has. Uh, said she had no illusions about why evangelicals supported Trump, who promised to deliver anti-abortion judges up and down the judicial system. Still, she could not comprehend how he became a champion of the faith. He became the banner, the poster child for the great white hope of evangelicalism, the salvation of the church and America, she said. Nothing could have prepared me for that. And I agree, nothing could have prepared me for that. It's one thing, like, and again, not all Christians did this, but the way they just defended Trump, supported Trump, treated Trump like he was the savior, not only of America, of the church itself. And then they merged this politic with this Christianity and it, well, began to corrupt Christianity. And I call it the political hijacking of the church. She was shocked. I'm right there with you, Beth. Okay, I, I, I've not been on your side in a lot of things from a theological perspective, but I definitely understand how you feel. I was as confused by it. As, I'm still confused by it. I still don't even know what happened. When, when, when people write about church history in the future and they look back, they're going, what were in the world were Christians thinking, right? But I, 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 some of us still don't get it. We still don't understand it. Um, she said, when Moore spoke out about Trump, the pushback was fierce, Book sales plummeted, as did ticket sales to her events. Her criticism of Trump was seen as an act of betrayal from fiscal 27, uh, 2017 to 2019. They lost more than $1.8 million. Please follow that. Nobody turned on her for theology. They turned on her for criticizing Trump. That's the reality of it. Now, then people ran out to the shed, opened the toolbox and go, what theological hammer can, oh yeah, here we go. Boom, Beth Moore preaches to men. Beth Moore needs to shut up and go back home. Beth Moore needs to stay in the kitchen. You know, and I'm not saying that everyone said it the exact same way. I'm, I'm utilizing a little hyperbolic language, but she was basically told to shut up and go home. We don't want to hear from you anymore. Oh, now we had no problem spending all of the, all of our women spending all of that money sending the women in our churches to your conferences we had no problem and leading you to what 15 million dollars whatever it was some crazy amount but no no now you've criticized Trump that's it you've jumped the shark turn no more buying her books no more supporting her and then her ministry loses over a million dollars and that interesting politics not theology politics not theology 
Uh, so she loses her ministry, loses one point eight million dollars after allegations of abuse and misconduct begin to surface among Southern Baptists in 2016. Moore also became increasingly concerned about her denomination's tolerance for leaders who treated women with disrespect. Uh Oh, now you're getting you see where she's getting herself in trouble. She's speaking against Trump. She's speaking against sexual abuse within the church. She now becomes the pariah. Now she becomes a problem. Has nothing to do with her preaching. In 2018, she wrote a letter to my brothers on her blog outlining her concerns about the defense she was expected to show, the deference she was expected to show male leaders going as far as wearing uh, flats instead of heels when she was serving alongside a man who was shorter than she was. Well, that's ridiculous that if, if anyone ever gave her that rule, hey, you got to wear flats, you can't wear a heel because you'll be taller than the man. Like, that's ridiculous. That If that is true, if that is true, that shows you how petty and how insane things can be within the Christian church. There is pride, there is ego, there is arrogance, and there is ungodliness. And I've stated this before, and if you've been listening to my teaching, if you go back to uh, what I did on Sunday, uh, from the Niagara Creed to Romans chapter 7, if you go back and listen to all of that, I've been really emphasizing this point. I don't care how much we try to sell how godly Christians are. We are ungodly sinners, and and that sin is present, and we got to stop pretending that we're something other. That, that's insane if that actually happened. That she was told to wear flats and not heels because of the male counterpart that she was going to be standing next to would be would end up looking shorter than her. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. I would care less. I don't care. Look, I, I hate to say it. I think there are some men, some Christian men, who are intimidated, intimidated by knowledgeable, strong, powerful women. I think, I just think they are. I think it's embarrassing. I think it's embarrassing. I've stated it before in my, in my life, being around within Christianity. I've always found the women in many cases to be far more theologically understanding and far more biblically minded than a lot of the Christian men. I, I hate to say that, but that's just what I've witnessed over and over and over. And I, I, and who, and I, I got no, I have, look, I am not intimidated at all if a a woman in my church knows the Bible better than me. Now, it means I need to study more if anyone in the church knows better than me, because I'm the pastor. I should know the Bible better than anyone. But you know what? I'm not intimidated by that at all. Why would you be intimidated by that? That's, I hope that's not true. I just hope that this is, just that, that report is not true. That, that's, that's crazy. She also began to speak out about her own experience of abuse, especially after a February 2019 report from the Houston Chronicle. Her hometown newspaper detailed more than 700 cases of sexual abuse among Southern Baptists over a 20-year period. Okay, now what? When these reports come out, Christians get all upset. This is the reality. Everyone in the Christian church is a sinner and sins. We, I don't know why we're always so shocked when these reports come out. <gasps> what? It happened. Christianity does not somehow, I know we preach it, that some magical transformation we become, we still have sin inside of us. It's still there. I, I know I don't want to go in that direction because I've talked so much about it, but all right, let's continue. Um, her social media feeds, especially Twitter, where she has nearly a, mil- a million followers, became filled with righteous anger and dismay over what she saw as a toxic mix of misogyny, nationalism, and and partisan politics taking over the evangelical world she loved. There we go. She's sitting there looking at Christianity going, what is happening to Christianity? I have been saying the exact same thing. Misogyny, nationalism, and partisan politics. Now, we could, we need to have a discussion about misogyny within the, the Christian church. We need to have a deeper conversation about that, whether you agree or disagree. But there is no argument about nationalism and partisan politics taking over the evangelical world, along with good-natured banter with friends and supporters to encourage them. Now, stop right here. Now, she became very bothered by all of this and which drove people to attack her mercilessly with, uh, with no mercy, no love, no compassion. And my thing is, why weren't people having hard conversations with her about doctrine and theology in the past? But now, now, no, she became woke and she became liberal. Because I'm telling you, if you speak out against sexual abuse and speak out against Donald Trump and speak out against Christian nationalism, you're woke and you're liberal. And we don't want any part of you. And I've said this. I Right now, the way the Christian church has become, just like Beth Moore feels, I don't feel at home in a large portion of American Christianity. 
I don't even feel like I belong. I feel like a complete outsider. I, if, if, I'm, if I didn't have my church, I don't even know where I would go to church because every church is so overwhelmed with partisan politics, Christian nationalism, and it's just nonsense. I wouldn't even feel welcome in most churches. I would feel like a complete outsider. Beth Moore is now, has felt that now within her denomination. Now, well, I don't know where it's going to lead to. I think it's going to probably lead to some, some, some big changes coming that, uh, uh, that a lot of people are not going to like. And people are going to say, well, see, that proves Beth Moore was never a Christian. But I just want to make sure you understand that it's easy to just say, oh, that person was never a Christian. And, and the Christ, Christianity never looks at itself and say, why did you drive so many people away? Well, when you're driving people out of the church, with your partisan politics, your Christian nationalism, and your Trump worship, when you drive people literally out of the church, don't blame the people driven out of the church. Blame the people driving everyone out of the church for something other than, I don't know, the truth of Scripture. Uh, she, uh, Beth Moore says, I can get myself in so much trouble on Twitter because it's kind of my jam. That's a very dated idea. It's kind of my jam. It's, it's my, ooh, this is my jam. Who says that in 2021? Okay, old people, old people just, hey, that, that phrase, uh, it went out 25 years ago. So let's just move on. And it was slang then, and it's no longer. Who Does, does people still say, oh, that's my jam? When they hear us, oh, that's my jam. Does people still say that? Can anyone tell me that? Do I have anyone a young listening? Does anyone still say, oh, that's my jam? I, 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 man, maybe, okay. Just whenever I hear people say things like that, it just makes me laugh. All right. My thing is to mess around with words and ideas. In other words, what she's claiming there, and we, and this is social media. Uh, we could get into a whole discussion about social media and why it's a purge on the earth, a scourge on the earth, and it needs to be purged from the earth. Um, I mean, she's kind of acknowledging she likes to just say things to spark controversy there. That's kind of her jam. She, I mean, I mean, let's, I mean, she does that. I mean, she, you, some, look, a lot, you have to ask yourself when someone, you, and you see famous people do this a lot on Twitter or on social media, they'll just throw out some kind of like controversial words and then boom, there'll be like 9,000 like comments underneath it, right? In the Twitter thread, you boom, 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 comment. And you'll note that the original person, they're not engaging with anyone. They're not even, you most likely they hit tweet and then they just walked away and they're not even looking. And everybody's like, da, 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 da. okay, Beth, you're this, Beth, you're this. And Beth's not even paying any attention to you. I don't know why people don't, can't catch on to it. It's like a setup. Just throw something out there, spark the controversy. And you've already moved on. You're living your life. You're not even worried about it. And everybody else is like, oh, I gotta get, I gotta get, I gotta get, I gotta let them know what I think. Nobody really cares probably what you think. You know, you think people care about what you think. That's why, look, there's that social media is very narcissistic in the way it feeds that you think people care about what you're having for lunch. So you gotta take a picture of it. People care that you're, you're, you're out somewhere and you're, I mean, like you think people care about what you're doing when reality is it's just something in their timeline to look at and they scroll right on past it. Or maybe they'll give you a thumbs up or a like or give you a quick comment and then that makes you feel good. You really think that people care that much, but they probably don't really care that much, but okay. Uh, in May, 2019, Moore said she did something she now describes as really dumb. A friend and fellow writer named Vicki Courtney mentioned on Twitter that she would be preaching in church on Mother's Day. I'm doing Mother's Day too, Vicki. Let's please, uh, let's please don't tell anyone this, Moore replied. The tweet immediately sparked a national debate among Southern Baptists and other evangelical leaders over whether women should be allowed to preach in church. Now I'm going to stop right there. Would it have been even controversial that she preached in that church? Would, would anyone have even given it a, a second thought if she had not already got herself in so much trouble about speaking against Trump, Christian nationalism, misogyny in the church? I wonder if it would have even sparked it. I'm going to argue it would have been a little blip on a radar and a few people would have noticed it. A few podcasters would have talked about it. But for the most part, I don't think it would have been that big a deal. But people were looking for a reason to get rid of her. There were, I think there were a reason. Now, she describes it, it was a really dumb idea. So she basically let everyone know she was going to be preaching on Mother's Day. Um, the tweet immediately sparked a, a national debate among Southern Baptists and other evangelical leaders over whether women should be allowed to preach in church. And I would, I would argue, I bet you, I think we could go back, and I'm pretty sure some of her conferences were held in churches. So 
Can you preach in a church for a conference, but not preach in, in a church on Mother's Day? Like, how how does that work? I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, I mean, we, we could talk, talk all day about that. There's just some, now, this is from Al, Albert Muller. He says this, there's just something about the order of creation that means that God intends for the preaching voice to be a male voice. Uh, Albert Moeller, Jr., president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, said on his podcast, which is called The Briefing, which you should sub- subscribe to. He does keep you informed about what's going on and does a pretty good job. Whether you always agree or disagree, at least it's good information. Uh, Georgia Baptist pastor uh, Josh uh, B-U-I-C-E urged the Southern Baptist and Lifeway to cancel more, lab- labeling her as a liberal threat to the denomination. Hey, now we need to get rid of her. She has a liberal threat to the denomination. We've got to get rid of her. All of a sudden now, you got to get rid of her? Well, I'm telling you, it's this. see, it's, she's a liberal threat. It's, it's political speech. It's political speech. A controversial California megachurch pastor, John MacArthur, summed up his thoughts in two words, telling more, go home. Now, to be fair, he said more after that. He explained his answer, but go home. Again, first of all, um, I am, just make sure back to the MacArthur comment because I at least have to address this quickly. That whole setup was just wrong right from the start. When you're, when you're doing one of those Q&As where you have a live audience in front of you and then someone's going to ask you some question about someone you, you should just know, don't answer. Just don't answer. Because there's no, you know you're getting ready to probably say something to try to, uh, one, to try to appeal to, or to entertain the crowd because that's what you do when you're there getting ready to speak in front of a crowd. It's inside of you. You want to say something that's going to get that reaction because those reactions, when people laugh or you, or, or you, come on, we're human beings. So already it's problematic. You're getting ready to talk about this woman in front of all of these people you know what? That's, that's not the time or place. MacArthur is powerful. Uh, Beth Moore is powerful. I'm pretty sure Macar- MacArthur's people could gotten, got, could get on the phone with Beth Moore's people and they could have met, had a meeting and he could discuss with her, hey, I've got some theological concerns. I've got some, and, and talk about it. But no, uh, you know, he's going to tell her to go home. All right. And of course, then, then all the Christian men are like, oh, yeah, tell that woman to go home. That's right. And it just comes across as misogynistic, arrogant, and it just, there's nothing godly that would come from a situation like that. Um, Moore, who said she would not become pastor of a Southern Baptist church to save my life, watched in amazement as her tweet began to dominate the conversation in the denomination, drowning out the concerns about abuse. Please note, she's been trying to fight about sexual abuse within the church, but the men wanted to fight about her supposedly preaching from the pulpit. Hey, let's overlook sexual, let's stop talking about sexual abuse. Let's talk about Beth Moore. She preached in a church on Mother's Day. She needs to go home. She needs to shut up. She needs to be quiet. Yeah, and you got a report around that same year of what all of that abuse that had happened in Southern Baptist churches. Maybe instead of worrying about her preaching, I'm not saying it shouldn't be addressed. Ultimately, in the Southern Baptist Convention, if you don't know how this works, each church is autonomous. So deal with the church, deal with that autonomous church who decided to let it happen. It's up, ultimately up to them. You may want to be worrying about all the churches where people are being sexually abused. But nobody wanted to deal with that uncomfortable topic. No, didn't want to deal with that. Still with Beth Moore. Beth Moore's the enemy. Not sexual abuse. Beth Moore. Not about people being, Beth Moore is the enemy. Now, again, it feels weird because it feels like I'm trying to defend her. By no means am I defending her because I think that there were theological issues going way back into the 1990s. And I think the whole, it was all a marketing campaign to sell Bible study guides to women. And I still don't understand that whole market and why women did that. But it feels weird that now, like, I'm like, you know, I, I, in some ways I can understand what happened to Beth Moore. How dare you go against the Christian nationalistic pro-Trump, pro-Republican hijacked Christianity. You're not allowed to do that. And, and sexual abuse within the church. Shh. We don't talk about that, Beth. Shh. Use your inside voice. Shh. Sexual abuse. Shh. Shh. Remember, everyone becomes a Christian. We're, we don't have those problems anymore. All right. Uh, we, we were in the middle of the biggest sexual abuse scandal that has ever hit our denomination. And suddenly the most important thing to talk about was whether or not a woman could stand at a pulpit and give a message. See how that all played out? Isn't it interesting that the timeline played out the way it did? 
When Moore attended the Southern Baptist annual meeting in June 2019 and spoke on a panel about abuse, she felt she was no longer welcome. Yeah, you're no longer welcome because, well, shh, we don't talk about these things. Um, things have only gotten worse since then, said Moore. The SB, SBC has been ro- ro- been rolled by debates over critical race theory, causing a number of high-profile black pastors to leave the denomination. Politics and Christian nationalism has crowded out the gospel, she said. Please hear that. Politics and Christian nationalism has crowded out the gospel. It's done that from American Christianity, not just the Southern Baptist Convention. With all this going on, Moore was working on a new uh, Bible study with her daughter, Melissa, on the New Testament's letter to Galatians. As she studied that book, Moore was struck by a passage where the Apostle Paul, the letter's author, describes the confrontation with Peter, another apostle, an early church leader, saying Peter's conduct was not in step with the gospel. That phrase, she said, resonated with her. It described what she and other uh, concerned Southern Baptists were seeing as being wrong in their denomination. It was not in step with the gospel, she said. It felt like we had landed on Mars. Um, and let's see. Yeah, this article goes on for much longer, um, goes on for much longer, and I don't, it, we're already at an hour, so I'm not gonna go back and read any more. But you get, I think, I think I've been able to clearly articulate my perspective on all of this. Beth Moore leaving the Southern Baptist Convention. I don't know where she's going. Look, I think she's very frustrated with what happened. I think she's very frustrated with with what has happened in American evangelical Christianity, with Trump, with politics, with all of this. And I think we're going, I think she's now going to become more outspoken. And I think we may say, we may be seeing a very distinct turn in her uh, beliefs, theology. I think we're going to see a very important turn. Where she's going to turn turn up? What kind of church is she going to end up? What kind of denomination is she going to end up? Where is she going? I don't know. I don't know, but I think we're going to see a major turn. And what happens is the minute she turns, right? Let's say she turns to a very liberal, maybe she turns to a very like, uh, let's say a pro-LGBTQ, pro-homosexual, very liberal perspective. Let's say she turns there. What, what's going to happen is all the people who've been criticizing her is going to say, see, we were right. See, we were right. And guess what's going to be overlooked? A lot of your criticism had nothing to do with her theology. You criticized her because you didn't like that she stood against your politics. And you didn't like the fact that she wanted to bring up the issue of sexual abuse within the church and misogyny in the church. And those are issues you are not comfortable dealing with. So now Beth Moore is going to, when she makes the turn, I think she's going to make the turn. I think it's inevitable. Then people are just going to dismiss her and everyone's going to move on. And guess, I think personally, I think she should have stayed and fight. I think she should have stayed and tried to fight because at least her voice would be heard now. But if she, if she turns and takes a major theological turn, let's say towards the left, theological turn to the left, not politically, but theologically, she's going to be dismissed outright and and she's going to be forgotten about and she'll, and her voice is going to be marginalized and she's not going to be heard from much more. There's still be plenty of women who will, who will defend her, but they're going to follow her to the left. They're going to follow her to the left and I think that that's the problem. And so what, what's going to get overlooked? Sexual abuse in the church? Uh, we've already moved on past that, right? Uh, Christian nationalism? No, you can't even argue. You, you can't even speak against that. The political hijacking of church? Nobody cares anymore. So the church is going to stay exactly like it was. She's going to be marginalized. Everyone's going to move on. And they'll look for the next big Christian superstar and Christian celebrity that can produce some books and they can sell some product. And the Christian uh, in industrial complex will just continue to roll on. And she'll just be a, the, 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 the celebrity of the past, just like Mark Driscoll was a celebrity at one time. Just name, you know, just name whoever the Christian celebrity was. They're there, they come, they fall, they, and we move on. And we replace them and everybody moves on. And sadly, nothing's going to become of any of it. I just wish, I think, look, I, I, I strongly disagree with many. I mean, I, we could go back into a lot of issues. I, I mean, I've had lots of issues. I've already articulated those. But man, when you have someone speaking up going, there's sexual abuse in the church, there's misogyny, there's issues here. You've got, and as a woman, you've got to listen to that voice at least and try to understand her perspective. And there's no question there was sexual abuse in the church. That's a fact. 
And then she was warning about the political hijacking of the church. She was warning about what Christians were doing and how they were overlooking some of the tra- things Trump had said and did, which offended many women. And, and, and women outside of the church was like, why would Christians support that? I thought Christians were against that kind of thing. The world were con- was confused by it. And what, what her, the entire thing, this is what I'll end with this. The entire story of Beth Moore leaving the Southern Baptist Convention and leaving Lifeway, it comes down to this. This is where we've become in the American church. Unless you hold to a certain politic, unless you hold to a certain political perspective, unless you hold to a certain, you know, almost a Christian nationalism, I know some people don't like that term, but a politically hijacked Christianity, you're not welcomed in the church. You're not welcomed in the church because the church has become so politically partisan so much political partisan divide that you're no longer welcomed in the church. And that should bother every single Christian to see that that's where we've ended up. We should have never ended up there, but that's what we have. And now trying to fight it makes you an outcast and you're no longer welcomed and you're going to be pushed out because Christianity has worked the same way high school works, conform or be cast out. Conform to the politically hijacked mess that is now American Christianity, or you go somewhere else. Sadly, what some people do, they will go somewhere else and they'll end up in an apostate liberal theology that is not Christianity. That's not the solution, right? The the politically conservative Christian nationalistic hijacked Christianity, that's not the solution, but you don't run to the liberal progressive hijacked Christianity, The problem is it's so divided. Where do you go if you just want Christianity, biblical, historical, where do you go? You you have nowhere to go. That is the problem. And Beth Moore's story is simply a symptom of that deeper problem. There you go. I'll stop right there. You can email me your disagreement. I know the people on YouTube. I know I'm ready for you to come. I'm probably going to lose some. I see we made it up to 81. We made it up to 81 subscribers on YouTube. And I thought we were, I thought we were on our way to 90. And then boom, the last time I looked, I think we had back down to 80. At one point we were back down to 75. Yeah. I, I'm not very good at building up subscribers on YouTube. So we're probably going to lose about 10 today. That's so, you know, we'll be down to 70 again. So it, it's yeah, it's crazy. But uh, you can email me those on YouTube if you you can just put derogatory comments or if you want to actually engage in an actual conversation. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Everyone have a great day. God bless.